There we go. Hey, good evening, good evening. Um, okay, there we go. We'll get the recording going. There we go. And let's jump in. Um, so, Carlos, we, we had looked at this presentation last last week, and we're just going to get a little farther tonight. Um, you know, remember with engine assembly, my big my big rule was clean, 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 right? Keeping everything clean. I mean, there's just so much stuff from the threads to the oil galleries to the tools you're using in your workspace. In fact, this is an area that we really struggled at Sierra College because the clean room had become a machine room with the balancer and stuff in there. So um, anyways, when you're doing assembly, you really want a clean workspace to do that. And we went through checking clearances. We talked about a test build. We, we talked about uh, piston, the cylinder, uh, piston the valve clearance uh, and the clay method versus using um, a dial indicator. And we even looked at a little bit at degreeing a camshaft. Um, and then where we kind of uh, limit, finished off was like, you could take that same clay concept and apply it to your oil pickup in your oil pan, right? You, you wanna end up where you have somewhere around at three eighths of an inch or so of clearance. So you don't want too little clearance where it can't, it's a restriction, but you don't want too much clearance where um, you're not picking up that nice cool oil off the bottom of the pan. So the clay check works well in that fashion, as, in that function as well. But tonight we're really jumping into assembly. And um, with that, uh, if you have a, a traditional engine that's not overhead um, overhead cam where your cam camshaft's up in the cylinder head, then the very first thing you end up putting in the engine is the camshaft. And so what I find is a lot of students who maybe are more familiar with working on Hondas or Miata engines or overhead cam engines they start putting pistons in their, their V8 and now they're all messed up. So if, if you happen to work on, on a V8 or an inline engine, any engine where the, um, where the camshaft is in the engine block, that putting that cam in, that's, that's your number one step or your first, first step on your build is putting that cam in there. And with that, uh, there's some stuff you have to think of, especially for flat tappet cams. Now, flat tappet means that the lifters here are just that, they're flat. So now, realistically, they're not really flat. In, in fact, these lifters have a little bit of a, a dome shape to them. That's hard to see with the naked eye, but they're slightly curved. Yeah, but yeah, and they're, they're offset from the cam lobe a little bit to try to um, distribute the, the tremendous pressure between the cam lobe and the face of the lifter correctly. These lifters are designed to spin in operation, right? Well, we call that a flat tappet cam. And I have cautions and lubrication. The caution is, is that these don't get the best lubrication. They rely on oil off the crankshaft flinging up onto the cam in any oil squirting out of the cam bearing journal area. Um, so they don't have the best lubrication. They have what you'd call splash lubrication. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of pressure there. In fact, there's more pressure between the lifter, face of this lifter here and this cam lobe than in any other part in the engine. So when we put the camshaft in, we really have to pay attention to using the proper assembly lube. And there's a trick to doing that. And we'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. Now, if we have a roller cam, meaning that it's got the, the lifters that have these little wheels on them, right? Whether it's this style over here or, or this style over there, um, those lifters are designed to not rotate. In fact, this one, you can see that these two lifters are linked together. 
right? So they go in pairs. It does make the lifter a little taller. It does make the lifter a little heavier. But just having this little wheel on here reduces the valve train friction by 50%. Really that much. 50% reduction. So that opens up some horsepower. It also allows you to have a much more radical cam throwing that lifter open. But because this whole assembly weighs more, that means on the other end of this thing, I'm going to have to have um, stiffer valve springs to close this because there's more weight moving back and forth here. Now this this one over here, it does it's not linked to another lifter um, in this image, but if you look at it very carefully, it has this little flat side. So it would have again, it would have a little link plate or a dog bone plate that looks like a little dog bone, and it, it's got two links in there, and then the side of it is made flat so the lifters cannot rotate. So again. With roller lifters, the lifters are not supposed to rotate. With flat tappet cams, the lifters do need to rotate. And then with that, um, there's different things going on here when it comes to cam thrust. And we'll talk about that in, ju in just a minute. Let's clear some of these drawings though. And what we'll do is move on to the next slide where we can play a video about it. The camshaft bearings should already be installed. This Let's turn that up a little bit. This time, lubricate them with a small amount of assembly lubricant or regular engine oil. Spread evenly. Clean all of the camshaft journals and lobes again. Spread assembly lubricant all over the distributor drive gear and all of the lobes of a new camshaft. This is a messy job, so start with the gear and the first four lobes at the rear of the cam. Spread some oil or assembly lube on the two rear journals and insert the cam in the block until we can leave it hanging on those two journals. This will leave the next four lobes of the cam easily accessible. Continue, making sure each lobe is fully coated with oil on the next journal and carefully pass it in. This would be a very messy procedure if you had lubricant on all the lobes. Okay, so this is a flat tappet cam, meaning that every lobe has to really be slathered up with engine assembly lube, which has a high amount of zinc in there to cushion the, the impact between the, or cushion the pressure, really not the impact, but the pressure between the lifter and the cam lobe. And if you didn't use that assembly lube, uh, and really slather it up, you'd end up burning up the cam when you went to start up the engine and break it in. Now, uh, just like they're showing here, it's best to do this in stages as you work the camshaft in the engine. I have students not do that all the time. They end up getting the, the engine assembly lube all over their clothes, making a huge ass mess. So engine oil on the journals, right? The polished surface here, a little engine oil on each journal but all the cam lobes get a healthy slathering of engine assembly lube as it goes together and it's best to put it in in stages just like you're seeing here. Wear gloves to protect your hands. It will make cleaning up a lot easier too. With the last set of lobes, hold the front of the cam with one hand and reach inside the block to feed the cam carefully in. If you leave out the cam plug in the very back of the block, it will help you to ease the final few inches of camshaft in. Don't so if you happen to put the crankshaft in, it would really be in your way for sliding that cam. You would not be able to steady the camshaft as you slid it in. The other thing in, in, in this series where we're, we're putting the camshaft in, what we are assuming here is we've already put in the oil gallery plugs, and the cam plugs in the back of the block. The other thing I would say that would make this job a little easier is you can buy a handle that you can bolt on the end of the camshaft. Here, a cam handle it's called, um, that basically just gives you a, a nice handle here to, to hold on to to help you get that camshaft in. But it is tricky in that gravity's 
trying to pull the camshaft down and it really wants to nick the lobes against the cam bearings that are already pushed inside the block. Um, so another way to do this would be to stand this engine up on its end. So let's see if I could kind of oh, like draw this that, engine. On a table flat. Okay. Yeah, on a table. So if I, you know, here's my table and that that's kind of the problem you, you really kind of want like a lower table right so it's not a, a mile tall but if you stood the engine up on its end here um it would make sliding in the camshaft a lot easier and you'd be a lot less likely to um, nick a lobe as you put that guy in there um sometimes i'll find that just the engine hanging on the engine stand there's enough downward uh, pressure here due to gravity that this thing actually warps enough where you're trying to put the camshaft in and you're really fighting it and or you get it in and, you, and it doesn't spin right and you're like, what's going on there's you think there's something wrong with the bearings and when you put the engine on a flat table or put it on its on its butt end so the block is no longer being warped um, then everything spins fine so uh, most of the time you can do exactly what he's doing right here. Sometimes you do run into problems and some engines like um, I had issues with old Chrysler's where it's like, I don't know how it worked from the factory, but it was like these cam bearing bores were not perfectly in alignment and they actually make um, uh, fixtures and adapters that you can put on your uh, line hone to to straighten out your cam bearing bores if you have to. Sounds like All right. Let me clear that stuff out of there. Don't forget to install the cam plug afterwards. If you decided to install the cam plug already, put the upper gear on the cam and slide it in with both hands from the front of the block. The camshaft should now be in place, fully lubricated and spinning smoothly. Obviously, if it didn't spin smoothly, you, you have to ask yourself what's what's wrong there, right? Because it's gonna it's gonna burn up. Well, all these parts at this point, everything should be spinning smoothly. Don't think, oh, well, it'll loosen up as it runs. What will usually happen is it'll seize up as it runs. Um, so without pistons in the engine right now, that, that cam should move easily. If you drop the crankshaft in, that should move easily. Um, and uh, I haven't forgot about the cam thrust part, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a, just a minute. Okay, so the other thing that we assumed in that video clip we just watched was that the cam bearings were in the engine. And earlier this semester, we did demo taking the, the um, interference fit cam bearings out of a V8 engine. You use the same tool to put them in the engine, but there are a few important things to know. For instance, these bearings they are not all the same size. So if you look at the box of new bearings, you'll see that they have different positions. So uh, these bearings, these two, this part number goes in position one, that bearing part number goes in positions two and five, and this part number goes in positions three and four. And if, um, if this was my V8 engine, basically, and I was looking at my different um, cam bearings that went in it. So ones towards the back are going to be just usually kind of like a little bit smaller than the ones towards the front. So anyways, there's a special order to put these in. How do you know? Read the bearing box. It will tell you. Now, what about how do you put them in as far as their, um, not just their order, but their actual positioning? Well, when it comes to that, if there um, is just an oil hole, not a groove, but there's just an oil hole, if you look down in this picture right here, you can see that that oil hole is being partially covered up by the bearing itself, right? So if all you have is an oil hole, it's absolutely imperative that you perfectly line up the hole with the hole in the bearing so that you get good oil flowing from the oil gallery into the bearing to lubricate the camshaft. 
Now, a lot of engines, they won't just, they won't just have a oil hole. For instance, on um, a small block Chevrolet, the really old ones, um, they just had a hole like, like you see here. But then sometime in, I want to say the 1960s, they decided instead of making a hole, let's just cut a groove or a channel that goes all the way around the cam bearing bore. Well, when they did that, then you didn't have to line up the hole in the bearing to the hole in the block. And you had some choice as to where to position that oil hole. Right, because now I have if this is my if this is the engine block here, I have the oil feeding in through an oil gallery coming in here, but then it goes through a channel and goes all the way around. So I can kind of pick where I want the holes in the bearing to be lined up. And what you'll see in that type of situation, the bearing manufacturers ha have figured out, like you, you could position the holes in any spot, but if you position the oil holes towards the top, maybe here and there or here and over here, what happens is that the oil on startup will come in here, it will fill this cavity as the engine begins to rotate this direction then it comes on in here and it lifts the camshaft off the off the bottom of the bearings and that helps you have good oil pressure and also minimal camshaft uh, wear and bearing wear so that's that's the preferred location is to put those those holes towards the top or top side of of the um, cam bearing board and again how do you know that stuff if you read the instructions in your cam bearing box it should tell you. Um, AERA has bulletins about it. Um, there's different ways to, to do it. If all you have is a oil hole, line, line that up perfectly. But if you have a groove, then you want to do this. Now, the last thing I have in here is manual fitting may be required. It is not uncommon when you're pressing in bearings with this, with that cam bearing removal and installation tool, that the edges of the bearing, they get a little, little messed up sometimes. Um, and so what you have to do is take a bearing scraper in here, or heck, you can even take a pocket knife or something, but you're going to take that scraper and wherever this is deformed, you're going to scrape that away until you get the camshaft to drop down in and have and spin freely. Sometimes you're, you're putting the camshaft in and taking it out several times and spinning it and seeing where the bearing is rubbing on the, on the cam and basically test fitting this thing um, multiple times, removing any high spots as needed so that you have a cam that spins perfectly smooth when you're all done. So that's what I mean when I have manual fitting may be required. And again, if you put the cam in and you're kind of fighting it, uh, you're probably better off to get it off the engine stand and at least on a flat bench where the whole engine is supported. And if you're really fighting it, put that engine up on its, on its butt end so you're not fighting gravity. So on the uh, cam bearings, what is position one, two, and five? Hang on one second. So what, what, are, what are the different positions? What is the position itself? Is it the angle that the uh, cam bearing is lined up or? Yeah, so if you, um, that's a good question. So if you see that there's a hole right here punched through the bearing shell, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these bearings will not just have one hole, but they might have two holes spaced, oh, maybe uh, 45 degrees apart. Okay. So you're trying to position, where do I want to put these holes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in this image, when you look at it, the, the engine, if I draw the, the engine block in here, here would be the, top, the uh, valley of the block, and there's the head gasket sealing surface. There's the other head gasket sealing surface, and then it comes down, crankshaft there at the bottom. So there's, 
there's basically the V engine. So um, why does it say load? Well, here's the timing chain going down to the crankshaft. So that timing chain as the engine's rotating is pulling down on it. And if we think about it, the oil galleries are going to be right above. I'll change my color here so it's a little easier to see. I'm going to have an oil gallery right above the camshaft that feeds the cam and uh, um, the crankshaft. And I'm going to have an oil gallery for that set of lifters and this set of lifters. Um, so what you're trying to do is, is position this because the oil actually will flow in around the camshaft and then it goes down and that's how it gets to the crankshaft. So if you put your holes in the bearing, if they're lined up towards the top, it just helps the oil kind of build up here. And then as you start to uh, spin the engine, it lifts the cam up. So it gives you good engine oil pressure on startup and helps lift the cam off of the, uh, off the bottoms of the bearings a little bit faster. But some engines won't have a groove that goes all the way around. And so you, you absolutely have to just line the holes up with the holes in the bearing. So, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of times we'll think in the, in the class, a lot of things we focus so much on machine work, but um, if the person doing the assembly put these cam bearings in wrong, they could burn the cam up in a hot minute um, if they didn't pay attention to what they're doing. And, Sometimes putting the cam bearings in and dropping the camshaft in is super easy. That's how they make it look in all the uh, high performance shows. But uh, sometimes you really fight it. It depends on, you know, what's happened to that block in its life and um, how well you actually hammered the bearings in. Did you make any burrs on there or anything like that? All right. Um, so once you had your cam in, you, you then install your crankshaft. If, if it was an overhead cam engine, then this, installing the crankshaft would be the first thing you would do. And um, with that, at this point, we don't have any pistons in. So when you get the crankshaft in, it, uh, it should spin nice and smooth. And the thing to watch um, on a crankshaft install is, what are you doing with the rear main oil seal? If it's a two piece oil seal, you better put the top half in the engine before you lay the crankshaft in place. And I've had many, many students not do that and they go to fire up their engine and it's puking oil all over the place because they forgot one half of the crank seal. And to put that seal in, you're taking the crankshaft out. So it's, it's a lot of work to get back down there. So notice here in this image, camshaft's in, it's all lathered up. They're setting up the rear main oil seal, the top half of it. They're laying in their bearings. Of course, at this point, we've already checked our bearing clearances, whether we've mic'd them or we've used plastic gauge or whatever method we did. We did. So we know our clearances are right. And now we're just doing our final assembly. Um, we should have also, uh, at this point, probably done our, um, our um, end play check as well. So, to kind of drive that home because a lot of these things you can talk about it but until you do it or at least see it done it doesn't make the most amount of sense so we're gonna see it done clean the saddles of the block and do the same to both sides of all the bearings to make sure there is no dust or buildup from the previous lubricant clean the crankshaft itself as well install the main bearings and double check that the oil holes line up with the ones in the block at the same time, clean the caps and wipe and install the bearings for them as well. When the okay, so just a, a quick pause here. A couple of things I want to point out from this image right here on the assembly. Um, the first thing is he's not using terry cloth towels. He's not using red shop rags. He's using lint free paper based cloths, right? That aren't going to leave a bunch of lint on the parts. Um, so that's super important for the cleanliness of your assembly. The second thing I want to point out here is that we have, um, we have paint on the block there, but not on the ceiling surfaces over here, right? Um, and an easy way to do that is to put your old sheet metal on, right? If you were going to replace the oil pan anyways, 
put the old one on, clean it up a little bit, put that on so that you can use it to mask off the areas when you're painting. So you only get paint on the surfaces that you want to have paint on. Typically your gasket sealing surfaces, right? Your deck surface, any, any oil pans or any, anything like that, you don't want paint on those areas. So you can tell just by the outline of, of where the paint is and where it's not and how it looks that he laid the old pan on here and that's what he used to get paint where he wanted the paint and not have paint where he didn't want to have the paint. And it, quite frankly, it, it's a hell of a lot faster and usually does a better job than you could do with a, you know, a couple, a uh, couple rolls of masking tape will take you quite a while to get the, the painting all done there. So, um, so lint free cloths, your paint works done and uh, use your old sheet metal to help you do a nice job painting stuff up and of course that's what you know when the build's all done that's what you see so I still think that that a good paint job is pretty darn important. Motor starts up for the first time and while it's running the crankshaft requires more lubrication than the camshaft. Engine assembly lubricant is better for the camshaft journals and lobes because it is specifically designed to provide the startup and break-in protection that high quality bearings deserve. Make sure you wipe some on the faces of the thrust bearing as well. If the engine has a two-piece main seal, install the upper half before lowering the crankshaft into place. On a neoprene rubber seal, the pointy lip must point towards the inside of the motor. When you press it into place, use the plastic protector shim between the seal and the block to keep the rubber back of the seal from being damaged by the sharp edge of the block. For engines with an older type of rope seal, work the rope into the groove of the block and then use a large socket to tap it deeper into the groove. Cut off the excess flush with the block using a razor knife, or just clip it off with some cutting pliers. You can bolt the cap in upside down for some motors to install the rope seal in the rear cap. In either case, put a little oil or assembly lube on the lip of the rope so the seal won't burn out on startup. So this seems, you know, kind of tedious, but again, you could do a great job on your machine work if you do crappy assembly and you fire up the engine, now it's got a leaky rear main, the customer's not gonna have much faith in your engine build. And of course, this seal is a real pain in the neck to, to, to change, right? Um, so if you're doing this, you might as well do it right. So just like they pointed out, um, having the seal in the right orientation where this lip is pointing in is, is super important. I've had students put it on the other way and it's like it just the oil just pumps right out of there and makes a huge mess. Um, I've also had students leave it completely out. Um, like they said, uh, the crankshaft should be nice and smooth and polished right there. They, it should have a speedy sleeve on it or something. So you have a good surface and a little dab of oil here. And on the two piece rear main seals, we're going to end up putting a little tiny bit of RTV sealant on here to keep oil from weeping out the, the end of the block. So with this, you can tell that obviously a one piece rear main seal is usually gonna do a better job sealing than a two piece rear main seal. That being said, this one that's on the screen right now, if you follow the steps properly, you can put those together and have them seal up and not, and not leak. The older rope seals that you might see on a vintage engine I mean, th those seem like they always seeped a little bit and that's just how it was, right? So anyways, um, a lot of those older rope seal engines though have been retrofitted. The aftermarket has made seal, seal kits for them. So you can put a seal in there that's like this in the place of an old rope seal oftentimes. All right, so we're still dropping in this crankshaft. We're prepping the seal. Let's see what else they have to say. For all types of engines, it's very important to put a dab of silicone sealer on each side of the seal where the rear cap meets the metal of the block. If you don't do this, oil will leak from the rear of the block because there is no gasket here. Spread a little on the tips of neoprene or rope seals as well. Be gentle as you lay the crankshaft in place. Then lubricate each of the caps and put them in place. Each bolt that goes into the engine needs to have some type of lubricant on its threads. The main cap bolts should have some engine oil on the threads to reach the proper torque setting. Make sure the bolts are threaded in a few turns, then tap on the caps to seal them. 
If you have rubber rear main seals, remember to use the protector shim on the seal when you put it in the rear main cap. And of course, rubber or rope seals get a bit of oil on the seal itself. The contact surfaces of the cap need to be cleaned to seal correctly against the silicone of the block. Before the main cap bolts can be torqued, they should also have some oil put on the cap where the head of the bolt is going to contact it. So all these bolts in your engine, whether it's your main bolts or your rod bolts, these are all a wet torque. So whatever the torque spec the book gives you, it's assuming that you're putting oil on those bolts just like you saw the guy do in this video clip here. You don't wanna just put oil down the hole because you don't want to risk hydro locking the oil in the bolt threads. I've seen people crack blocks doing that. So putting a little oil on the bolt, getting stuff started, make sure you tap down the registers with the hammer before you start to tighten these up and you put a few drops of oil on, on the heads here where it will touch the cap as before you torque it down. Um, and that's how you're going to get the right torque values on your assembly there. Make sure you have all the torque specifications for your engine readily available. You should be able to find what you need in the correct repair manual. Carry out the final torquing of the main caps in three increments. Whatever the torque specification, tighten the bolts first to one third that amount then two-thirds, then again to final specification. If you have four bolt main caps, do the inner bolts first. Leave the cap that has the thrust bearing in it for last. When the other caps are correctly tightened, hit the back of the crank with a rubber mallet or hammer on another hammer to line up and seat the thrust bearings. Now go through the three increments to torque the cap with the thrust bearings. Inner bolts first if it's a four bolt cap. Okay, so, um... You know, there, there's definitely an order to do stuff here. So they talked about having multiple increments, right? Three different steps to torquing down those main bolts. They also said, hey, if, if you have a four bolt main, you're gonna do the center, um, center, center bolts first, right? Um, the other thing is I like to start as far as my caps go, I start on the inside and then I move to, to the outer outside of the engine as I'm torquing stuff down. And my last cap I'm going to torque, which sometimes it throws off my idea from inside to outside. If the, if the main thrust cap is in the middle of the engine, well, that, I'm, that's the one I'm going to leave. So I'm going to say thrust bearing last. So if I look at this engine right here, this cap here, this big wide one, this is my main thrust bearing. In fact, you can just see there's a little bit of bearing material on the side there poking out. And so it's got a main bearing that not only does the inside part, but it does the edges. It's the main bearing with those two sides on there. And remember that what it's going to do is it's controlling the backward and forward movement of the crankshaft. Well, we have to get these two surfaces lined up with each other because I don't want the top half of the bearing here, but the bottom half of the bearing is over here, right? So the two surfaces are not, are not level with each other, they're, they're off. So by keeping this thing loose and then taking the, the hammer and um, you know, driving the crankshaft that way, driving it the other way. Basically, what that does is it aligns up. It lines up both the top half and the bottom half of the main thrust bearing. Once I do that, then I can torque it down, like you see the guy doing here. So again, there's there's a there's definitely a, a step, a procedure to do this. And oftentimes, if you're watching a build show or video, they skip through this stuff really fast. And if you do it incorrectly, you can end up with not enough crankshaft end play 
and you're, you know, basically you you screwed up your build. You can be wiping out bearings. Um, so, anyways, setting this up correctly is is important on this particular engine too. Of course, that also has your oil seal on it, so you had to set up the the sealant and everything correct there as well. Bolts first if it's a four bolt cap. For a one piece rear main seal, you need access to the rear of the block. This type of engine uses an adapter that bolts to the block. This way, the rear main seal is fitted in after the adapter is sealed and bolted in place. To install the seal, you will probably have to take the block out of the stand so that you have access to the rear area of the block. Then lift the engine back onto the stand after installing the seal. You may be able to install the adapter while it is on the block if you can get it past the engine stand adapter. Alternatively, you can leave the main seal and install it later. So what you'll find is most modern engines have a one piece seal and that's usually something you'll install later once you have it off the engine stand. You just have to remember to put that, uh, put that one piece rear main on there, right? So, um, okay, so now we have a, an engine, our camshafts in, um, our crankshafts in, our crankshaft should, should spin very smoothly at this point. The camshaft should spin very smoothly. Uh, the crankshaft is, is torqued down the specification. Um, at this point, you know, we're, we're ready to start installing pistons in our engine, but we have to make sure we got our rings on our pistons. And again, there is a step to do that. Um, so we're going to do the oil control rings first, right? We're going to work on the bottom of the piston and work our way up. So we're going to do the oil control rings first. We're going to be looking for any marks on the rings. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to splay our ring gaps. So all important things as we're going together. Now, to get the rings on, we've talked a little bit about this before. Um, there's piston ring expanders. I honestly don't like them because you have a lot of leverage here with this expander. And I've had a lot of students over the years over expand the rings and ruin them. I've even done it myself. And uh, on most engines, you can't just get one piston ring, you're, you're getting a set. So it's a real, it's a real um, bummer to, to go through all this. Now, before I'm putting the piston rings in, I've obviously have filed the ring gaps to the, to the proper width. Um, that's generally speaking somewhere about four thousandths per inch of uh, bore in a stock configuration. And of course that number grows if I'm, you know, gonna be running this engine harder or, or boosting it, running nitrous, that type of thing. So if this is a uh, small block Chevy with a four inch bore, let's say in this uh, picture here, if that's four inches, then my ring gap that I would have set up, it would have, would have been like a minimum of 16, that's supposed to be a six, 16 thousandths of an inch. Um, what I have found is usually if you're buying fairly stock rings, they're usually pre-gapped and they're pretty close. They're in the ballpark. But if you're buying rings that are like some high performance, you know, special, um, you know, total seal, crazy rings, those rings you're probably going to, they're, they're probably not going to have any gap and, and you're making your gap. You have to file them to fit. So um, I have on here, read your ring pack instructions. They will tell you what to look for. Super important. The guys who don't read this stuff are the guys that get in trouble and end up with a bur burned up engine on their fresh build. So this is very similar to installing like apex seals at a high performance, right? Having to take them to grind their fire. Yeah, I mean, because there's a whole fitment process there as well, right? And so the, the devil here is in the, in the details. Um, so again, we're going we're gonna to pick it apart here and pick apart a video clip on it. Rotate the block until one of the decks is facing up and is level. Lock the stand in this position. 
Wipe the cylinders clean with a dry paper towel. Don't use a shop rag. Then put some clean engine oil on another paper towel and wipe a thin, even film all over the cylinders. Paper towels do leave some paper lint behind, but that is much less damaging than the stray fibers that can come off a cloth shop towel. Rotate the crankshaft so that the forward rod journal is pointing down and it's... Okay. I've linked videos in here wrong, I'm realizing. So we're going we're gonna to switch stuff a little bit. Just going to share my whole computer screen here real quick. Because um, that, that guy, he was getting ready to put the pistons in, and we're still trying to get the rings on. So we've got a little bit of, uh, of work to do. Um, let's see here. We will go to minimize that, minimize that. I should have install piston install piston rings. Watch it this way. Once the cylinder bores are at their final sizes, the new piston rings need to be checked and, if necessary, fitted. Many ring sets come out of the box, appropriately sized for the diameter measurement of the cylinder bore. The gap in the ring must be at a precise specification when it is installed on the piston and inserted into the bore. To check this, fit a ring into the newly honed cylinder. Use a piston to push the ring to be checked down into the bore. A ring installed in the second groove of the piston acts as a stop so that the ring doesn't get pushed down too far. Use a feeler gauge to check that the ring cap is at the specification shown in the repair manual. Some types of rings are called file to fit or custom gap rings. The gap will be too small at first and will need to be filed down until it is the right size. The ring can be filed by hand, one side at a time, moving the file towards the inside of the ring diameter only. Or you can use a filing machine, which can file both ends of the ring at once. A lot of machine shops can do all of this for you. Many of them have powered machines that can do this job very quickly and precisely. Doing it by hand is a tedious process. If you do have custom fit rings, just make sure to keep them in order and label them as they are cut to fit. They'll need to match back to the exact bore that they were filed to fit into. Once all of the machining processes are complete, everything needs to be thoroughly cleaned in preparation for the assembly process. Hot water and soap do a great job. If you do the final washing yourself, make sure to blow out everything very well with compressed air. Machined and regular metal surfaces can be kept from rusting with regular applications of WD-40. This water displacement fluid forces water out of the pores of metal surfaces and prevents corrosion. And it should be used both on the inside and the outside of your newly machined components. Okay. Once the cylinder bores are... So a couple things that I really liked that he did here was that he organized his rings and laid them all out. He checked the ring gap. Again, stock rings like they were using in this video, like, you know, fairly production stuff. They're, they're going to be pretty well gapped right out of the box, right? You could see that ring had a gap in it already. If you put in some real fancy high-performance rings, those would be the ones that you would be using the, um, the special filer here to, to get your ring gaps because they would start off with, with, with no ring gap in them. And again, if you have, um, you know, if you're going to be running the engine harder, you, you want bigger ring gaps because the ring is going to grow more due to the more heat in the combustion process. If the two ends of the ring butt up together, it'll, it'll blow out the ring land and, and ruin everything. So, um, so I like how he, how he laid them out and he fit them in there and then started laying them on, on his engine. Um, what it didn't show you here, if I close this out and I go back to our presentation, if I can just get some white <coughs> surface here, is that, um, uh, let's see, he, oh, he didn't, uh, he didn't splay the ring gaps, but actually I have that, I have that here. Hmm. 
Thought I had it there. Oh no, I was looking at this image. Okay, so I don't have it. All right, we can we can make it though. We can draw it. All right. Um, so if I'm going to put, oh, I know what I'll do. Hang on a second. We'll go. Screen. Share. See if we get an image here that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a pretty common uh, diagram right here where they talk about well, where do you put the gaps in the piston rings, right? This is probably actually a better diagram um, where you don't want all the ring gaps lined up with each other because that's going to allow combustion gases just to go straight down the engine and you're not going to straight down the cylinder, you're not going to build up any compression. So what you'll notice here is that the top ring gap is set up and then the middle ring gap is somewhere around 180, 120 degrees from that one. And then we end up again splaying all of our ring gaps or offsetting them. So none of the rings are lined up. What, uh, and so I used to look at images like this in my repair manual or um, like I said, the one that you would see a lot would maybe be something like this where you can see every, everything's kind of offset. And man, I'd be perfectly making those rings like it showed in this picture. If you tore, if you ran the engine for a minute though and tore it apart, guess what? None, none of the rings would be in that orientation anymore. And the reason is, is that these rings are all spinning almost kind of like they vibrate and slowly spin in the engine as it runs. So I just try to make sure that they are all spaced somewhere around 120 degrees apart. I also like to keep the ring gaps off of the, off of the major and minor thrust surfaces. So you, if you have a ring gap and one of those edges is kind of sharp, it, you don't get any scratching in the cylinder walls. Um, the other thing that would be important is to uh, make sure that the oil control ring doesn't get overlapped on itself. So setting up the ring gaps correctly is, is pretty important. And so you get the gaps set up correctly, you get everything offset so you're not gonna be losing compression. You got stuff in the right fashion so it's not gonna be scratching up the cylinder walls. Now I can start putting the pistons in the engine. And um, that's the one thing I'll find that in class, we go to put the pistons in the engine. If I didn't think it would got crazy before, it's kind of like all hell breaks loose when we go to put the pistons in the engine. Um, just a, a lot of people tend to struggle with this step. And again, it's hard to get one piston ring oftentimes. You're getting a whole set. So you really don't want to damage your rings as you're putting them together. So is so, 120 degrees the general consensus of the piston? Yeah. Ring? And like I said, I used to really agonize over this. And then I, and then I actually, I was doing some training with Briggs and Stratton. And, and they're the ones that have said, hey, you know, those rings actually spin. And they actually made a nice video graphic about it that showed how it works. And if, you almost think of like if, if you watch something that was on a surface that was vibrating and the vibration is causing it to slowly walk around, that's yeah. kind of how the rings spin. So they're not just spinning like a fan blade in there, but they are slowly working their way around. So if you can just get everything spread out so the ring gaps are not lined up, you know, that you'll be in good shape. You don't really have to agonize over it because oftentimes trying to get, once you get the pistons in the engine, just using the ring compressor and stuff, those ring gaps will get moved around a little bit on you anyways. So you're just trying to make sure that, you know, all the, all the gaps aren't lined up with each other and you should be good. Now, um, I have on here, when you're doing this, use the right tools um, also really important is to put pieces of hose over your rod bolts, right? So this is what Chris didn't do and he ended up scratching up his crankshaft yeah. 
um, and was pretty was pretty stressed out about that. And we tried to polish it and because um, it was already ground like twenty under. So yeah, I was the one who was helping them actually. Yeah, so you know it, th this is really important to do. You got your bearing in here. Those are on there. You've lubed up the piston rings. Um, you don't want to break piston rings uh, when you're doing this step. So let's see what I did. I, I don't know, like maybe I got my two videos backwards. We'll see what we got up here in the queue here and see if, if this thing times out correctly or not. Take the appropriate rod bearing half from the storage bin. Wipe any residual oil off the rod and the back of the bearing and install bearing and install the bearing shell. When the engine starts up for the first time, the rod bearings are subjected to an extreme amount of stress while there is no oil pressure. Make sure that you use a high pressure assembly lubricant to protect the bearings during the first few critical moments after startup until the oil pressure stabilizes. After a liberal coating, put on the rod bolt protectors. Make sure that the protector bolts seal all the way to the rod body. Also, double check that the bearing shell is fully seated in the rod. To set the positions of the ring gaps in the piston, start by putting a few drops of engine oil along each groove. Next, grasp all the rings together and spin them around to spread a light coating throughout the rings and grooves. With a clean paper towel, wipe any large drips and spread a light coating evenly over both skirts of the pistons as well. Start on one side of the block and all the ring gaps should be oriented the same way. The top compression ring gap should be here. The second ring gap is located opposite the top ring at this position. In the oil ring groove, the point where the wavy expander ring butts together should line up with the gap in the top ring. Then hold the expander ring with a thumb and fingertip and slide the oil scraper ring so that one is in this position and the other is in this position. Each should be about 45 degrees to the left or right of the second ring gap. If you try to slide the piston into its bore now, the rings will stop it from sliding in. To install each piston, we need to put it in a ring compressor. There are a lot of different ring compressors available. The ribbon style compressor is the least recommended as they are not easy to use and they are more likely to break rings. If this is all you have, just be careful and tighten slowly. This and any other type of compressor can start to get crooked while it is being tightened. With any compressor, it's possible to pinch a ring in its groove and break it. This means you have to buy a whole new set of rings just to replace the broken one. To reduce that risk, use a quality ring compressor, such as this universal style. With any type of compressor, fit the piston in and tighten the compressor until it's just holding the rings. Square up the compressor and look down inside. As you slowly tighten the compressor, make sure the ring gap positions stay where you want them and rock the compressor slightly left and right to make sure that the rings aren't caught on the edges of their grooves. When the compressor is about to pinch tight against the edge of the piston, it's ready to go into its bore. So a couple key things, obviously um, we've had to put the piston on correctly onto the rod, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we're putting that piston and rod assembly in the engine, the arrow is going to face the front side of the engine. Now this video clip went over the piston ring gap orientation. Uh, keep in mind everything we've been talking about with the piston rings and how they rotate and the ring gaps, that all applies to four stroke engines. If you happen to be building a dirt bike or a two-stroke engine, those piston rings on two strokes do not, they're not supposed to spin. They have a piston ring locating pin and so they, they clock on in a certain spot and they're supposed to stay there. So um, that's an important thing. If you're working on a two-stroke, it's a little different. The rings are not supposed to spin because there's ports in the sides of the cylinder walls. So here he's got a good piston ring compressor um, and he set up the ring compressor so that the rings themselves, they're not like, let me try drawing that again, that didn't work. Um, the rings themselves are not way up at the top of the compressor. The rings are really close to the bottom. So it's, it's, ready, to, it's ready to go. You don't have to move this thing down an inch before, before those rings are gonna be going in the cylinder wall. So he's, he's clocked this thing up uh, correctly here as he's getting ready to put these rings in. Check to make sure that the crankshaft rod journal is in the bottom dead center position. 
Also, make sure the forward mark on the piston is facing the front of the engine. Once the piston is in its bore, it'll be square with the block. With the compressor on the deck of the block, tap the edges so that the compressor sits square to the block on all sides. Now tighten the compressor until it pinches tight on the piston. If you have a compressor with a hose clamp, loosen the tension a half turn just to release some of the squeeze on the piston. Rotate the compressor and make sure it's sitting square on the deck and that it's perpendicular to the block itself. Look up into the cylinder from below and slide the connecting rod over so that there is some clearance between it and the crank throw as you hammer in the piston. So again, I, it's just, I've had lots of problems where students are on the step and they end up scoring up crankshafts and just causing all kinds of carnage, right? So one, one of the first things he did is he put the, the crank, he put it to um, BDC so that the crank throw is all the way down, right? The journal. So we have lots of room here to work and then you're going to be guiding you're going to be guiding this guy to make sure that he drops into place the first one if it's a v engine and you have two rod assemblies sharing one journal the first one's usually pretty gravy it's when you're trying to get the second one to sneak in there that you really have to guide things into place so uh, you know pay attention to that so you, you got it your rod, rod bolt protectors or really your crank protector, your rod bolt covers are on, uh, you got your, your ring compressor set up right, it's squared to the top of the deck surface. Um, let's keep going here. Use the rubber handle of a hammer or give the piston some solid hits with a piston hammer. You need to hit it hard enough to make it slide past the grip of the ring compressor. If you feel even the slightest resistance, stop and check the compressor. If you see any of the oil scraper rings popping out, or even one of the compression rings, stop and immediately pull the compressor off. If you're tapping very slowly, a little at a time, and a ring keeps popping out, try hitting a little harder in the beginning so that the piston will move quickly past the entrance at the block deck. Once the piston is in, put the compressor aside and just tap lightly to move the rod down until it contacts the crankshaft. So I see a couple things, either people they don't hit hard enough, so it's moving down too slow, and then the rings squirt out of the gap, or they hit like a, a gorilla and they break rings. Um, and a lot of times what happens is first, they start off and they're hitting too slow, the ring squirts out between the ring compressor and the top surface of the block, and it gets stuck. And then they switch over from going too slow to gorilla mode and start beating the tar out of it and they break a ring. That's kind of the normal pattern that I've seen over and over again. So it's, it's finding, that, um, finding that balance. The protector boots will guide the rod into place on the crank and the rod will seat nicely on the rod journal as long as your bearing is still in place. Lubricate the cap that goes with the rod and look at the marks you stamped on the sides of the rod and cap to fit the cap on the right way. When the cap is in place, thread on the nuts and thread them hand tight with a ratchet. In pre-assembly, you should have checked to make sure the cam didn't interfere with the rotation of the piston and rods. Now, rotate the crank a few times to make sure that the rings aren't scarring the walls of the cylinder. If the ring broke while you were putting in the pistons, you should notice some scratching on the walls. Look all around the cylinders as you rotate and see if you notice any scratches that weren't there before. If you see a scratch, run your fingernail against it. If you're concerned that the scratch might be from a broken ring, pull out the piston and check the rings. If everything is in order, reinstall that piston and move on to the next one. Rotate the next rod journal to its bottom position, and when the compressor is tight, tap on it again to make sure it's square with the block. With the pistons on the first side of the block, it's easy to slide the rod over to avoid hitting the throw of the crank as you hammer the pistons in. You should start to get a feel for how much force you need to get the rings to slide out of the compressor and pass the block deck. If a ring pops out of its groove, you should be able to feel immediately that the piston is stuck. Simply reset the compressor, square it all up, and try again. With each piston that goes in, you'll feel the rotation of the crank getting a bit harder to turn. There should be a steady increase in resistance as each piston is added. When the first side of your block has all of its pistons in and rotating smoothly, 
you can rotate the block to the other side. Dust the cylinders and lubricate the walls with an even coat of oil. Before the pistons go in on this side, set the ring gap positions on the pistons. On the second side, the pistons are simply the reverse of those on the first side. As the pistons go in on this side of the engine, there is less room for them to be clear of the crankshaft throw and the rod of the piston that was installed on the other side. As soon as the piston rings clear the deck and you can move the compressor out of the way, make sure that you keep the rod that is being installed from hitting either the crankshaft or the rod from the other side of the block. As soon as the rod is just past the edge of the crank throw, you can press it against the crankshaft throw and push the other rod over to make room for the one being installed to slip into place. Again, when it's time to put on the cap, make sure the marks on the cap and the rod are on the same side as each other. As you do your check rotations, always rotate in the direction that the engine will be operating once it starts up. Continue cleaning and lubricating the bearings as you go. As the last few pistons go in, the crank will become more difficult to rotate. However, it should still be possible to rotate it with one hand, even if the engine has a rope seal that pinches on the rear of the crankshaft. So, I, I liked exactly how they did that there. They did it in steps, and um, with each piston that you put in the engine, the engine will get slightly harder to turn and slightly harder to turn and slightly harder to turn, and that's normal. If you put one in there, and all of a sudden you can't turn it, then you know, okay, that's my problem. If you just threw everything together and now the crank's locked up, now you're taking everything apart because you, you don't know what, what was the thing that's, what, what's messed up, right? What, what was the thing you put together incorrectly that's, that's causing the issues? So by checking it in stages, it's a really smart way to go on, on assembly. He's got a, a special socket here to turn the crankshaft. Um, he did one half of the engine and then the other half took his time as he went across there Again, this is uh, something that they make look like it's two seconds long on a normal engine build type show, whether it's engine masters or engine power or hot rod TV or, um, but it's really something that, uh, you know, takes, takes a little bit of time to get it done and done correctly. Rotate the block upside down. Have a crank turning tool installed and rotate the first rod journal up. Set the torque wrench to the first of three increments. Torque all of the bolts for the first rod journal. Set the wrench to the second increment and torque them again. Then set the wrench to the third and final setting and torque all four of the bolts. Rotate the crank so that the next rod journal is facing up and then go through the three increments to reach the final torque setting on all the rod bolts. So before when he put the pistons in, he, he kind of made all these rod bolts hand tight, right? Well, now he's going through and torquing them, and uh, he's torquing them in sets. And in between each set, you'd want to rotate your engine again to make sure that if you tighten one of the rods and now the crankshaft doesn't turn, well, that's where your problem is. You wouldn't want to do the whole row, and then, you know, your crankshaft doesn't turn. Now, you're, you're again, you're taking it all apart again. So making sure that the numbers, your stampings line up perfectly, um, your bearings are, are in place and they're oriented correctly. All that stuff is, is super important. And again, three increments as you're working your way up to final torque value um, is, is important as you're, as you're torquing down these rods. I can tell you firsthand, if you have an improperly torqued rod, one that's not torqued down, the, the engine within, within a few seconds, it'll end up throwing that rod and causing problems. So it really, it really changes quickly and, and a lot of damage is done in a short period of time if you do not torque the rod bolts down correctly. After you have torqued all of the rod journals, leave the wrench on the final setting and go through every bolt once more. If you miss any of them now, you won't be able to go back and check after the oil pan is installed. Okay, so now we got our pistons in our engine and we're moving right along, right? But to kind of just drive this home just a little bit more, um, uh, you know, he used the right uh, he used the right tools when he did this, right? And then uh, I have here position everything correctly to do what I call jump the gap. In that, if um, if this is my ring compressor 
on here. And maybe here's the band going across, right, with the hose clamp there. Um, even if you tighten that thing down and it's squeezing the rings down into their grooves, there's going to be just a little bit of a gap between the top surface of the block and the bottom of that ring compressor. Now, as, as the machinist at the machine shop, we would have put a little bit of a chamfer on here, right, going out to help those rings guide in there, but there's still going to be a slight gap. So you try to get the position, the piston and the rings positioned really closely to the bottom of the ring compressor, right? The, the top surface of the block, if you will, like I've kind of drawn it out here. And then it should be a couple quick hits and it should just drop and jump that little bit, little gap right here and drop down in. You don't want the ring squirting out. And like I said, what I've had happen time and time and time again is that people will start go, going too slowly and a ring will get caught in that gap and then it'll get stuck. And then the next student gets on there and he goes from the guy going too slow to the gorilla guy and he starts just beating the tar to this and then he ends up breaking, breaking a ring. So um, anyways, rotate the engine on each step to check for binding. Uh, those are all good, uh, all good tips. Now related to um, Related to this theme, if I go to my screen here, um, what I'm going to do is fire up my document camera, and I want to show you a couple of my my tools here. Oh no! There we go. Okay. So um, in the video. Get the cut out of there. In the video, he used a, a piston hammer, much like this one. This is a snap on one I bought, and I used it a number, a, a few times, and realized I absolutely hated it. You're so extended, and you just, it's just hard to get everything centered up. This one, I, I dropped it one time, and it broke the bottom off. I mean, just, I did not like this style very much at all, right? Rather than use that, you'd be better off just using a regular hammer handle. Although if I was going to use a hammer handle right here, I have a regular ball peen hammer. I would like to have a handle that wasn't wood. So I don't get any like wood splinters in there, but I would get, you know, one that has maybe a rubber coating like this, like the sole craftsman hammer I have right here. This, this works pretty good for installing pistons, but my, uh, my favorite tool would be actually this. This is an actual piston hammer. You can see it's got a smaller end and a little bit bigger end in there. Yeah. And if I shake it, um, you can see it's got it's got lead shot in there, so it's like a dead blow action, and it works really well. Um, I ended up buying these for the school because it doesn't allow you to have get a lot of force, right? Like if you have, well, even this hammer here, you can swing that thing and make a tremendous amount of force and really break stuff. This this seems to help prevent the piston ring breakages that I was getting. So that's my favorite um, piston hammer there. Um, think I can make that with some PVC? Say that again? Do you think I can make that with some PVC or no? Uh, no, I. it's it's a soft, it looks like a white plastic, but it's actually pretty soft. Okay. Um, they're not real expensive. You can get them from Summit and other places, and they're not, they're not an arm and a leg. Um, this is the same style of ring compressor that he was using in the video. And it's my favorite style as well, much better than the ribbon style. Um, they also make these where they're not, see how this is that hose clamp, it's adjustable. Yeah. They do make these where they're just one size. So let's say... I I was just doing four inch bore engines. I could get one of these it's just perfectly for a four inch bore. I don't have any adjustment on there and I use that one for four inch bores. And if I have, um, let's say I have a, a 82 millimeter bore, I could get one of these that's built to 82 millimeters. This one here, much like the one that he was using in the video, it does give you some um, adjustment window. 
right? Mm -hmm. So this will go from four inch bores to four inches, 120 thousandths, right? So it has some adjustability. So let's say I had a small block Chevy, which normally is a four inch bore, and then I, I bored it 60 thousandths over, hey, this, this ring compressor is gonna work just fine for that. Yeah. Um, but if I had like a big block Chevy that was then bored 60 thousandths over, well, this ring compressor is not gonna go big enough for that. Or if I had a 305, it's not gonna go small enough for that. So it definitely has a window. So, uh, I don't know, silly me, these were my favorite style of ring compressor. Um, so I bought like a whole class set of different sizes and I hung them all up in a display cabinet. And I thought, man, I, I got this dialed in. And then of course chaos ensued um, because the problem was is people had to read these numbers there. And of course, these numbers have to correspond to your bore size. So you have to know what your bore size is. So you know what one of these that's hanging on the shelf or hanging on the wall to pick. Um, so it, it is my favorite style of ring compressor. It does require some knowledge of the builder. You have to know exactly what your bore size is to make sure, and then you have to read and see if it's in this window. And I know that's the, both of those sound like simple things, but um, uh, we, we continually struggle with it. Um, but the, the ribbon style, everybody rips those apart. So I'm not sure what the, what the right um, method is. I have found that at, uh, at Sierra where everybody's working on their own engine, they, I don't have nearly as many broken piston ring complaints as when everybody's working on my engine. So anyways, um, good style ring compressor if you read the instructions. Oh, I guess one thing to point out is um, if you can almost tell why, if you look at the bottom there, that's thicker oh, yeah. than it is there, right? So this, this thing is tapered. So the piston, you have to drop the piston in through the top. Um, you can't have the, the label upside down and trying to get this thing to work. That's something else I've had people do wrong quite a bit. So, um, That's but, why I always see people pushing in pistons at first before they... Yeah, it, they, you know, you, you, like I said, a lot of the shows make putting the pistons in, they make it look super easy. And there, there are some steps there, and, and I never anticipated how many problems I would have with it until I started teaching engine classes, and then it was like, holy crap. And every time I thought I had it figured out, like, oh, this can't get screwed up, then, then something else would get screwed up. So, <laughs> But the common ones with this tool is people trying to use it upside down, or they're, they're using the wrong size one for their bore, or they don't know what their bore is. So, you know, like I have some of these that go from – you know, um, let's say roughly three and three quarter inches, like three inches, 750 thousandths, and they might go to, you know, three inches, uh, 900 thousandths. So it's just under a four inch bore. Well, it, it's almost big enough to work, but it won't quite work if you have a four inch bore. So anyways, you do have to know some stuff, but I, I really like that style of setup uh, when you use it properly. So, all right, um, let me switch this thing back. And we'll finish up um, the uh, presentation tonight. Just a couple quick things here on oil pumps. If the engine has a press on pickup tube, make sure that the marks you made during pre assembly are still lined up. If your pump uses some kind of collar to hold the drive shaft on, install it now. Most pumps will have a solid drive shaft that just slides into place. Be sure to install this shaft in the right direction so that it slides into the block all the way. Hold the shaft while you slip the pump into place and thread the oil pump bolt in. It is not usually necessary to use a gasket between the oil pump and the block. Also, gasket pieces sometimes break off and get into the oil system. So I would say it's more common than not to not have any gasket or any sealer between the block and the oil pickup just for that reason. You don't want it sucking anything in there and clogging up the oil passages. So it's usually just two precision uh, machine surfaces. So you want to make sure the, the surfaces are nice and flat and smooth. And even if there's a slight amount of leakage, it won't be enough to cause a problem. It'll be much safer than if you um, had a gasket in there and it got sucked into place or so. 
Uh, two, two metal surfaces, usually no gasket, no sealer on an oil pump install. Torque the oil pump bolt or bolts, then check to make sure the drive shaft is fitted into its slot in the pump, since the block is upside down. Make sure that the rod bolts are tight. Then check your notes and the manual to make sure that you haven't forgotten to reinstall other extras, such as a windage tray. Clean the block rail and the edge of the oil pan with some solvent. Put some dabs of gasket sealant at a few points along the block rail to help the gasket stay lined up over the bolt holes. Then put dabs of silicone sealer at the four points where the rear main seal and the front timing cover seal arch up. So I, I realized I, I should have put this clip later in the sequence because at this point in the engine, we've already put on the timing cover. Um, and I didn't want to point out that this engine, the way it's put together, the timing cover gasket or the timing cover itself also forms a gasket surface with the oil pan, right? So if I wanted to um, remove the timing cover, I would have to drop the pan, pan down a little bit. So those two things uh, in, intersect like that. Um, other engines, the timing cover is totally separate from the oil pan. Um, and that's one of the things that makes a big difference. Um, uh, I've had a, a number of people go, oh, I'm just gonna change this timing cover gasket and they don't realize that they're gonna have to drop the oil pan to do that. And it's in a pickup truck that's four wheel drive. So now they gotta pull the, the front differential out of the way and it just turns into a, a huge job. So, um, so I just wanted to point out those those things. The, the other thing, well, I'll, I'll get it going and pause it at a better spot. Away from the block rail. Lay the block rail gaskets in place. Okay, so he used a dab of sealer at the corners. I commonly see people go crazy with the sealer. You don't need to put too much sealer in there. Um, you go too crazy with it and you end up with a bunch of that sealer getting all clogged up in here in the oil pickup tube. Um, or a pickup screen. There's just a wire mesh screen in here uh, that filters out the oil a little bit before it goes into the pump itself. Um, I've seen these all clogged up full of RTV silicone and then the engine ended up spinning main bearings and stuff because of the lack of oil pressure. Um, the other thing that you, you'll notice is that, hey, this oil pickup sits right at the bottom of the oil pan, right? We talked about it being uh, somewhere around three eighths of an inch maybe away from the bottom of the pan. So if you ever, you know, go to change an engine mount and you see guys putting a floor jack underneath the oil pan, which we, you know, we do all the time. I've done it myself. Just when you're doing it, you better be darn careful that you don't, if I draw an oil pan on here, let's say this is my oil pan laying down there, I got to be careful that I don't put a big old dent in the pan and push the pickup up out of the way because then I'll, I'll ruin the motor. And, and I had a, 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 a student um, who her and her dad built basically this engine. They did, and they did a, a, you know, a good job until the very last thing. Like they did a great job on the bill. They, they really father daughter project. It was it was going great. They go to put the engine in the car, they're getting the motor mounts bolts lined up and they do exactly what I'm saying. They end up putting a, a pretty good sized dent in the pan. It pushes the oil pickup out of the oil a little bit. So the front tip of this pickup is not exposed to oil, it's sucking air. They fire up the motor and it's sucking air in with the oil stream. So you don't have just solid oil flowing through the galleries. Now you have like an oil foam and within, you know, five minutes to running on the break-in procedure, they basically roasted all the bearings in their motor um, be, because of that. So be very careful if you're ever, you know, supporting an engine from its oil pan. If you dent the oil pan, it's very easy to push the pickup out of the way. As you can see that this one, it's just pressed in place there. So it, it'll move. Um, and then, and then you could ruin your engine from doing that. So they, they like they did everything right, and then they got to that one part and ruined it all. So, um, a piece of wood on top of the jack. As yeah, well. you, you put a piece of wood on there. Do something to try to disperse the weight, or just make sure you're not. It's not supporting all the weight, right? Like if you're just kind of, you know, supporting some of the weight of the engine with the pan, 
it probably would have been fine. I think they were having a problem getting the bolts to line up and they actually started lifting the whole engine up against like the mounts to try to get stuff to line up as they fought it together. They would have been better off to put the cherry picker back on there and lift the front of the motor that way. Um, uh, and you know, stuff happens though. And maybe you're being real careful. If you dent the pan, you know, you, you better look at it. And if it's a good size dent, then you're, you're dropping that pan and banging out that dent and fixing that oil pickup. Cause it's, it's, it's likely moved it. And it's just, it's just not worth the, worth the risk. So, all right, let's finish this thing up. If they don't fit perfectly in the corners, you may need to cut a few small pieces with some scissors. If you don't have a one piece oil pan seal like this, then put the front timing cover seal on next. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions, but in most cases you won't need any sealer for rubber or cork style seals. Some gasket sets come with a few choices for the oil pan front and rear seals. Make sure you pick the right size gasket from the kit that will match your timing cover seal and oil pan. The same thing applies to the rear cap seal. Once you have the right one, press it firmly into place. If you have a cork rear cap seal, it's a good idea to coil up the gasket and hold its shape together with a rubber band. This will give a pre-curl to the gasket and it will be easier to install in the curved slot on the rear cap. With all types of engines, after the front and rear oil pan seals are in place, you should put another four dabs of silicone sealer in each of the corners where the oil pan will curve from the block rail to the arch of the front or rear seal. Lower the oil pan carefully into place. Start with the four corner bolts. This will make it easier to line up all the others. Thread in the rest of the bolts a few turns by hand. You may need to bang on the pan a little to get some of the bolts to start in their holes, but make sure you don't dislodge the gasket or push it inside the block. When the bolts are all seated hand tight, switch to a torque wrench. These bolts will also have a low torque rating, so make sure your wrench is accurate at low settings. Work around the pan from the center bolts in a spiral outward to the front and rear bolts. With almost all oil pan gaskets, it's a good idea to let the pan sit for a minute after you torque the final setting. Then go back through all the bolts again. You will probably find they need a third circuit around for them to actually get to the torque specification. If your engine has a thin gap between the oil pan and the timing cover, it's a good idea to lay a thin bead of silicone sealer along this lip. Spread the silicone evenly with a finger. Turn the engine back upright. The short block is completely sealed and assembled. Okay. Um... So you can see that uh, three-piece oil pan gaskets kind of suck. Mm -hmm. um, if you can replace it with a one-piece, which they're usually available through the aftermarket, it's a lot easier to set up, less prone to leaks. But we did see all the good tips to putting together a three-piece gasket. Yeah. Um, a little bit of that sealer definitely goes a long, a long way. Um, where I goofed up is I should have shown you this slide before we put the oil pump on yeah. um after you you got the camshaft in you got the uh, uh crankshaft in and your pistons in then you'd be dropping um or putting together your your timing uh chain set now at this point you know if you've already done a test build and you were inclined to degree the cam you would have already done that uh so here we're just putting stuff together and that's why I have on here that you would line up the timing marks that you've chosen, right? Maybe you're going to choose a different slot here for a little bit of timing advance, cam timing advanced, or you're retarding the cam timing or something like that. Um, I have on here chain versus gear. This is the classic gear drive. You would see a muscle car guy run that makes that real loud whining noise. And the reason it makes such a loud whining noise is these are straight cut or spur gears. Yeah. And so some, you know, street squirrel, hot rod enthusiasts, they'll, they'll like that. And, and even I myself, I, I find that I like that for like, I don't know, 20 minutes. And then after a while, it gets kind of irritating. But um, what you would want to do is, is line up the marks. Usually you're lining up two dots to face each other. Obviously on an overhead cam engine, getting the timing line marks line up becomes a lot more of a, a detailed uh, procedure. A um, couple other quick notes on here, right? This camshaft has a lock plate. So once you torque these three bolts down, then you fold over 
that plate to keep them from loosening up. And the torque value of these bolts is, is actually a lot less than you think it would be. And I'm, I've been surprised on how many times I've had people over torque those bolts and break a bolt off on the end of their camshaft. So watch out for that. Okay. Now I have one last thing in here and that's about thrust plates. Remember earlier, I was talking about a solid lifter and the cam lobes. So let's say this is my lifter. It's a flat tappet lifter. Although we know it's not really flat, it has a little bit of curvature to it. And it's riding on a cam lobe. Now that cam lobe is slightly offset. And so here's the, here's the cam lobe and it's gonna rotate that way. And because this lifter is offset and it's got a little bit of a curve to it, it's gonna cause the lifter, that flat tappet lifter to rotate a little bit like that. And what that does is it disperses the pressure between these guys. And if the lifter is not allowed to rotate, it will eat up that cam lobe real fast. Well, this offset here, basically what it, what it causes is, it, is the way these guys uh, touch each other, it's going to force the cam backwards in the engine against the back of the cam gear and keep the camshaft in play, place. So that keeps, takes care of camshaft thrust. But if I installed a, um, let's say I went to roller uh, lifters, well, now I don't have that, the, the, the um, angles of that uh, working with me to keep the camshaft from moving back and forth. So I'm going to have to put on some type of spring loaded button on the front of the cam gear, or, or I'm going to have to do something to control camshaft movement and that might be installing a thrust plate underneath the cam camshaft sprocket something like that so when you switch from flat tappets to rollers there's a couple things that comes into play and one of those things is now i got to do something to control the the orientation of the camshaft forward and backwards in the engine because i don't have the lifter um, uh, the angles of the lifter kind of forcing it back of the engine all the time so lots of little things to take keep uh, keep in mind as you start changing parts of the engine going to roller lifters is a pretty popular swap and I've seen lots of people forget some of these things or just not know and they do it wrong and then they end up with a bunch of problems as they start running their engine so all right um, for the uh, the gear drive for that top sprocket yeah would you prefer doing a safety wire instead of the uh, instead of the plate you could it usually comes with these plates though and they work they work fine. Um, you just you just hammer over those little tabs there, and it just takes but a minute. And you don't find that that like I've never had them. If you if you bent the tabs over, I've never had one of those come come loose on me. Um, uh, so, it, but it, they're kind of a one time use thing. Mm -hmm. In my school motors, I don't even run those lock plates because they don't run long enough for it to be a problem. And I'd be buying a bunch of lock plates all the time. Yeah. Um, some engines might just have a special lock head on the on the bolt on the fasteners, but those lock plates are pretty pretty common. And and like I said, I, I haven't had too many problems unless people start trying to reuse the lock plate a bunch of times. Okay. Um, so we saw this guy putting together all these different, um, like the oil pan gasket and stuff. And I, I just wanted, I had a couple slides here that, you know, the right product for the job is um, super important, right? The right product for the job. And so in some cases they might use a non-hardening sealer, like you would use this on the outside of a, like a one piece, uh, rear main seal or a front uh, balancer seal. Um, he used some different um, uh, like high tack compounds to get the gaskets to stick in place. Um, again, when you're doing gaskets, right, it's everything should be should be nice and flat. I've seen guys are, oh, why does it leak? Well, the valve cover gasket or the oil pan gasket's been over torqued and the bottom surfaces aren't flat. And, so don't over torque stuff and make sure all your surfaces are really flat. Um, also, you know, people tend to go crazy 
with the sealants. And so my, my thing is that too much sealant kills. Um, we have a, a, a BRZ that was donated to us from Subaru and at 30,000 miles, it went to the dealer and they said, oh, it, it's got a little bit of a leak from the cam carrier and they did a reseal job. And then 4,000 miles later, it came back with an engine knock and they ended up putting a long block in it and this and that and the other. And I think the whole thing went astray when they did that reseal job and they used too much product in there and started clogging up oil passages. So a little bit of sealer goes, goes a long way. So this chart here is also from Permatex. It's their gasket maker selector. So this would be like the RTVs. So you might use a dab of this in the corners, uh, something like that. Um, and so I, I have a couple of, of tips on this that I actually got uh, from uh, back um, before, I can't remember if it was Loctite bought out Permatex or they were bought by another company, but we used to have some pretty good um, Permatex reps that would come out. They would come out and um, and do presentations uh, for us. So let's see if I can get. I got all kind of. Yeah, I got the document camera going up now. Okay, so um, when it comes to like using the gasket makers um the rule that he gave us he, he said hey i'm not a raiders fan but he recommended silver and black and so for the silver they make a product called moto seal that works really well um so the moto seal it's also um a, a, like a close cousin of it is 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 called ultra gray if you're working on imports toyotas hondas mazdas you'll notice that they use some type of RTV sealant, it's gray, and it's yeah. going to be a close derivative to either Moto Seal or Ultra Gray. Okay. If you're working on a domestic, right, Chevy, Ford, uh, Chrysler, they usually have a black uh, gasket sealant, and it's a close cousin to Ultra Black. So he said, you know, if you stick with the silver and gray, if you stick with the Raiders colors, you're probably going to have a professional looking build, and you're not going to have leaks if you use the products correctly. Um, also remember, don't use too much. So like cutting the applicator tip to the right size, um, for modern engines, you're, you're probably never making that tip any wider than what I've cut right here. Cause a little bit of this stuff goes, goes a real long ways. If you ever want to test it out, if you, if you got like a piece of glass and another flat surface, squeeze a little bead on there and press down the glass. It's amazing how, how wide this stuff spreads out as you um, as you torque the two surfaces down so um, all right so um, so with that um, you know we, we had our short block put together and of course if I have an engine with no heads on that engine just like we saw at the at the end of the last video clip that's what they consider a short block is right once you buy an engine and it's got heads on it now it's a long block um what we'll do because we're already running a little bit over time is we'll talk about putting the putting the heads on next week so um our next week's topic is we'll put the heads on we'll get the valve train in we'll finish our assembly we'll finish our build if you will um and then we'll also have a very short presentation on just proper break-in procedures to, to properly finish off that engine build. Um, what I want to do now, though, is I want to, let's see, I'm sharing the screen. Good. Is I'm going to close, close this out and get the internet up again. And, nope, I don't want that. I'm going to get our class up here. Clear all the drawings. All right, uh, Carlos, can you see my uh, screen where I'm looking at our uh, our Canvas page? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, and what I'll do is I'll get myself out of the way there. And I'm going to go to uh, Student View. 
which should put up a pink edging, but it should make it look more similar to what you would see on your screen. Mm -hmm. And um, what, uh, what do you need to do? There, there is a couple um, discussions. I'd like you to just watch a, a, a few videos okay. and make some comments. So I think where we're at right now is I did have one on cylinder honing. Um, but the one I really love for you to watch is this, and it's a little bit more entertaining, is there's this one from Engine Power where this character right here, he's one of the hosts of the show. He goes to his old machine shop. He starts putting together inline six. It quickly shows you some of the machine um, equipment. And then I want to say the next episode, the part two, they actually do the assembly work on the engine and run it on the dyno. It's a pretty good because it, you know, everything they show you very quickly, all the stuff we talked about. But if you know what you're looking for, it's, it's kind of neat to pick it out. Um, so if you could participate in that discussion, that would be fantastic. And then the main thing to do, and it's a, it's a pretty, pretty entertaining um, show, really. Uh, oh, and I guess I should back up to that if I go back to the discussion. And I think it's also listed under assignments. Um, uh, where is it? Old School 6. There it is. Um, the reason I picked this one, not only for because what they were doing on there, is you have a couple different ways you can watch it. You, if you have Amazon Prime, and I know a lot of folks do, a lot of folks have Amazon Prime not to watch the TV shows, but to get crap from Amazon. But um, uh, if you have Amazon, you can watch it without any commercials or anything. But if you don't have Amazon, you can still watch it. It's actually, if you go to- Yeah, I just clicked on the link. You can yeah, Power it. Nation TV. The only the only thing that sucks is if you're watching it on Power Nation TV, I don't know, the, they'll throw some co commercials in there. They're usually all commercials for car parts though, so it's not it's not terrible, but. Um, you know what, I didn't even have to search for it. It's actually the first thing and I recommend it right now. Yeah, okay. so. It's it's a it's it's a pretty pretty entertaining uh, one. So um, you know, watch that, make a few comments, um, and then if I go here to quizzes, I took your final exam and I, I was trying to block it out in the sections. Okay. So if I click block work quiz, you can see it's only sixteen questions. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you have three different attempts. And uh, I, I thought I had it on here. I guess it, it's not. But, but basically, if, if uh, the block work, if I go to modules, um, chapter 10 in your textbook is about engine blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So those questions pretty much all can be found in chapter 10. Um, in fact, the questions that are in the back of your chapter of your book are gonna closely relate to, the, to these questions. So um, your final exam, I took a few questions from chapter 10, a few questions from chapters 11 uh, and 12, and uh, the engine assembly chapter, which I'm not seeing here, so I gotta get that opened up. Um, but basically, um, to, to essentially do your final, you're gonna have a couple of quizzes to do. The first one, this block work one's actually opened up already. We have um, talked about uh, all the stuff that's on this. Um, some of it we talked about early on in the semester, like when we were taking apart our, um, our engines, right? So we have some engine inspection type stuff. Um, but then it does get into a little bit of, um, of machine work and we were, we were talking about that as well. Um, even on that old school six video, they actually put a um, cylinder sleeve in an engine. So um, it kind of goes over some of that stuff as well. Um, so, and again, these questions pretty closely line up with what's in the back of your textbook, depending upon what edition of the textbook you have. Um, but you'll be able to get the answers out of there as well. So, um, so for instance, like this, we actually that. saw this one tonight. Uh, you know, what do you clean your engine with after honing? It's 
it's hot soapy water, right? Because you're trying to lift the uh, the honing grit out of out of get out of the engine. And then actually that that question, every time I've taken my ASC test on engine repair, I always see this question on my ASC test. Uh, what do you what do you clean the cylinders with? So, anyways, um, so that's really what you have to do. You have some discussions to do. And, and you'll have a couple of tests, which are the same tests you would have done in class. I just broke it up into sections to make it a little bit easier to do in chunks. I'll get the other ones loaded on and you'll have until the end of the semester to do those. This one is up and running right now. So, um, so with that, uh, that's kind of all I have for tonight. Next week, like I said, we'll finish up the assembly. I'll go over some break-in stuff. In fact, if I open up the calendar here. Um, so today's the seventh. Next week, like I said, we'll, um, we'll, do, some, we'll do some class uh, wrap up. We'll go through engine break in. We'll wrap up the assembly. Um, I'll, we'll do a little bit of a review of the test just like I was doing just now. I'll have the other tests open for you. And then you'll, you'll basically have another week to do your tests and get those submitted and I'll start chunking that all together for your for your grades and stuff. So that's how we'll wrap this thing up. It's it's kind of it's this is kind of a weird deal. Normally yeah. the last day of class, like on the 21st, we would have our automotive picnic or at least a like a pizza party or something in class. And with this distance learning model, we're not able to do that. But um, that's how we'll finish this thing up. That the last day of the semester for Sierra College is technically May 23rd. So if you guys can try to get all your stuff, uh, you know, turned in, you know, on the 21st, uh, that, that would be great. That way I can start chunking that together and get, get everything submitted to Sierra College by, by the 23rd. So, all right, any questions on anything? Uh, the only question I have actually is, uh, could you use the clay method for dry sumps as well? Could you use the... Um, so the what see, method? The the clay method to see where your depth is when you use it when you're doing an oil pickup. Uh yeah, so on a on a dry sump uh, setup, um, there's usually multiple spots where you're picking up the oil. So yeah, you could you could do clearance checks between the pan and the um and the, the pan up. and the oil pickup, but you're usually gonna have multiple oil pickup spots in the engine because oftentimes a dry sump if um, if uh, here's my engine it will have a pump off the side right mm -hmm. and it's driven off of a belt going to the front of the crankshaft it's usually multiple pumps on here that are being driven and so they're grabbing the sides of the oil pan in different in different spots so you can you could do the clay check for some of those spots, other spots that might not practically fit in there, right? But what what a dry sump system's doing is it's it's sucking and scavenging all the oil out of the bottom of the pan, yeah. so that when the crankshaft's spinning around in here, it's not whipping around any oil. All the oil, every every last drop, if I make the oil, I guess I, should, I could make it brown or something there's an oil um, it's gonna oil, it's, right? you're gonna have very little oil and it's constantly sucking it in here and it's sucking some oil it's also sucking in air the pumps made to handle that oil and air and then it's going to pump to a reservoir and that reservoir is going to fill up with oil so you you end up with you know pure oil and not just this foam deal and then from there we are going to um, pump the oil out of, you know, it'll, it'll pump from, um, from the reservoir um, to the oil galleries and lubricate everything. Okay. And um, where you see, uh, so one of the things I, I got to do is um, run some engines on, on an engine dyno uh, and we did one where the only thing we changed, and this was a Honda K-series engine, um, the only thing we changed is we went from wet sump to dry sump. So we didn't, you know, change camshafts or heads or any of that crap. Um, and we got, I want to say, like 23 horsepower. It was, it was a pretty significant improvement yeah. in horsepower from the engine. 
Um, and you think, my, my goodness, is it just from the crankshaft whipping around this oil? Well, that's, that's part of it. But the other part is that normally we think of the pistons moving up against compression. Mm -hmm. But when the pistons move down, right? When a piston's moving down, if there's pressure inside the crankcase, you're moving the piston downward against pressure as well, right? And you'll hear uh -huh. um, people in the engine world talk about pumping losses. Well, having this oil pump in the engine, right? What this basically does is it makes, uh, it makes the engine a, um, it makes the crankcase this, this has now a low pressure on it or a vacuum down here in the crankcase. And so that reduces the pumping loss so that your, the pistons aren't fighting their way down and that frees up some power as well. And so I was surprised how much of a performance increase we got from that dry sump. It, it does make everything a hell of a lot more complicated. Now you got this yeah. pump on the side of the engine, all this extra plumbing and crap. Um, I mean, there's a lot of extra crap there going on that has to be all plumbed together for a dry sump system, but it does open up power um, because of the pumping losses and because of the, uh, the, the reduced oil foaming. And of course, you know, if you're doing high G cornering, you're right, you're getting, you're making sure you're always supplying good oil to all your bearings. Yeah. There's a lot of advantages. Um, one thing that I saw that was pretty trick that's kind of related to this that was about the pumping loss uh -huh. is I was at the racetrack and some guys were running, they were running uh, 500 cc's, so 600, 600 cc four stroke uh, like street bikes. And I, it was some type of like racing spec class or something. And guys were basically running like little vacuums off of, um, off a of cordless, uh, cordless electric drill uh, motors. I'm looking oh, for like, like little know. battery packs. I'm looking for my yeah. battery pack. Um, so they had these little pumps and they had, you know, battery packs like this plugged into their, into their, into their bikes. And it was basically oh. running a little, a little vacuum pump to suck the crankcase into a vacuum to reduce the pumping losses and the free up horsepower. And they said it, it was pretty significant, especially at higher RPM. So Especially for the motorbikes as well. Yeah, I, I thought that I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, that guys were running that. That was kind of like the hot, hot setup, and it was, you know, was that going to continue to be legally allowed? And anyways, because <laughs> it definitely was an advantage. The guys who were in the front were running that little setup on their bikes. So, um, good question. So, yeah, I mean, if if you have pickups towards the bottom of the pan. By all means, clay those pickups, make sure they're in the right spots. Yeah. With dry sumps, you oftentimes have several pickup points. You may not be able to clay every one of those points, but dry sumps are, are pretty darn cool, but they are also, you know, definitely increase the complexity of your engine build and compartment and access to stuff. So it's one of those things you gotta, you gotta weigh out. And they are not cheap. Plumbing all that together, that's, huh. that's, uh, several several hundred dollars and can can even break up into the thousands depending upon how elaborate your system is and how many stages are in your your dry sump so yeah with the inline filters and scavenge manifolds and stuff yeah yeah exactly yeah so there's there's all kinds of um, all kinds of stuff there so um with that uh, i think we'll, we'll wrap it up um i hope to, to see you online next week i hope you're you're you know, safe out there. And you said, you said work was picking up. It was keeping you pretty busy because you were, you guys don't, you, not all the techs are back in the shop. So yeah. Yeah. And that's what um, some of my other teachers that are working uh, in the industry, that's what they're saying there. They, they don't have, you know, if they had a full crew, they wouldn't have enough work, but because the, they're running such short, sh small crews that everybody that's there is busier than they were in a normal deal. So um, anyways, cool for me, because I get to do new things, you know, like actually do new services and doing R and R. So it's, yeah, like, it's a lot well, that's, fun. that's good. Hopefully it'll, it'll allow you to get better experience than you otherwise would have normally had. So yeah. um, that's really good. So 
All right, well, stay safe out there. I hope to see you online next week and we'll, we'll wrap this thing up, okay? You too, thank you. All right, good night. <laughs> uh, all right, very good. See you.